sure did enjoy the flute, Bernetti. Thank you for playing for us. That was so good. And, and you guys need to uh, thank our deep bench. We have uh, our backup crew operating our AV stuff today. And you know what? If you gave that to me to do, it would have probably already been in the floor down here. But uh, thank you guys for uh, pitching in and helping with that. And, you know, Thanksgiving is a time that some people come and others go in order that they can be with their families. And so thank you guys for pitching in for that. Hey, did you see the uh, super moon last week? You did see that. You know, I had to leave immediately after church last Sunday, and so I had to get to Waco for the annual meeting of the Baptist General Convention of Texas, and right as I was driving into Waco, guess what? The super moon was coming up, and so I timed it perfectly for that trip and got to see it. Then on Monday night was really the peak, and I hope you got to see it then, too. You know, we had great cloud-free uh, sunset times and moonrise times this week and then got to see it again on Tuesday too I was over in East Texas and got to see it I hope you got to see it and last week we made a reference to that you know last week we started the first we did the first part of this uh, message today well 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 it's about the woman at the well and the encounter that she had with Jesus and that's why I even mentioned the super moon you know the moon wasn't any bigger than it always is it was just closer and so the same thing, this lady at the well, the woman at the well, had heard some things about Jesus. But when she had the opportunity to get close to him, then he made that huge impression on her life. And he, he was just close to her. He took the initiative to get really close to her, just like the moon did to us this week, and, and made a lasting impression. And so today we're going to finish the story about the woman at the well. And you know, think of it, before this day came, the conversation she had with Jesus by that well, think of what she had to show for life. She had five former husbands, a live-in boyfriend, and an empty jug. And that's all she had to show for life. And she lived in a part of the country that all good self-respecting Jews totally would avoid. And she had so many things against her. And that's what makes this story so remarkable that uh, Jesus took the initiative to get close to her and then serve for an example for all of us what he does when we let him get close to us. So we'll, we'll do that. We'll finish that story. You can go ahead and turn to it. It's in John chapter 4. And uh, we will look at, the like Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story about the lady the woman at the well. And uh, I'll be reading in, in my translation, but I want to encourage you to get your Bibles out. And uh, you may, you know, like I this week as I read this passage over and again, I ended up underlining some things. And, you know, the more I read it, the more stuff got underlined. So you may want to underline or make some notes in your margin or just take some notes about this because there are some things, there's some remarkable elements to this story that uh, I've so enjoyed. Let's read it together. I will interrupt our reading a couple of times along the way, but then at the end, we will just go back to a couple of the phrases in this passage that made a deep impression on me this week. It says in your bulletin, we're going to begin reading at verse 28, but I changed my mind. That's not the first time that's happened, is it? Uh, we'll start one verse early. We'll start in verse 27. And last week, we just stopped when... The conversation between the woman and Jesus was interrupted. And that conversation just stopped right then. And this was how she was interrupted, how that conversation was interrupted, beginning at John chapter 4, verse 27. Then his disciples returned, and they were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want to the woman? Or why are you talking with her? with Jesus. And then, here's one of those phrases that struck out, stuck out to me this week, leaving her water jar. The woman went back to town and said to the people, verse 29 now, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Parenthetically, we can say, and he loved her anyway, treated her with deep respect and gave dignity back to a lady that the whole community had taken away from her. And then she just asked this question. 
And it, re it impressed me too to think, you know, the people that she had previously been avoiding, that's why she would come to the well in the middle of the day when there was less likely to be any other people there. The people that she had avoided and practiced maybe for years avoiding, look what she did. She rushed to the very people that she had previously been avoiding and said, could this be the Messiah? Just ask that question. In verse 30, look at their response. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Again, getting close, getting close to Jesus. And then there was this little exchange that took place between Jesus and his disciples when, after the lady had left before she had returned. And the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. Look at Jesus' response, verse 32. He said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And then the disciples said to each other, it's kind of puzzling, could someone have brought him food? And then he clarifies, verse 34, my food, Jesus said unto them, is to obey the one, the will of the one who sent me and to finish the work he gave me to do. Verse 35, know you have a saying, it's four months until harvest? I tell you, and I think he saw the people coming. I tell you, open your eyes. Look, he said, look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. I picture that, that statement of Jesus coinciding, seeing the people of Samaria come to the well where the lady had been close to Jesus. Look at the field, it's ripe for harvest, using that as a metaphor. Let's go back to the food deal. Why, why this exchange about food? How many of you, um, I'm kind of bad about this. I have other friends who have never missed a meal or meal time, but I can get busy with a project and forget about eating. Some of you guys have experienced that, haven't you? And sometimes because it's so fun, but sometimes because it's so hard. You know, you just, you, you get focused in on it. And I think that's what happened to Jesus. You know, it says earlier in the story that we read last week that he was tired from his journey. He's probably hungry too. And he asked the disciples to go to town to get some food. He was hungry. But then this lady comes. And again, no surprise to him. You know, sovereign God knew all this was going to take place beforehand. But it was in this conversation that, with this lady that, that had such high stakes. I think he was so focused on her that he totally forgot about his own needs. And isn't it good when that happens to us? It's always a gift from God when we can take our attention off of ourselves and give our attention to another, even to the extent to which we even forget that we were in need, that we are in need. I saw this morning, if you guys noticed, it was during the welcome time. The Rodriguez kids bringing their, um, their Christmas child. What's it called, something, child? Operation Christmas Child. They're bringing their boxes. And that was a picture of the very thing that Jesus experienced in giving to another so often our own needs then are even forgotten about. And that's what happened to him. He hadn't eaten. And the disciples were all thinking, did somebody bring him food? No, he said, no, I've been nourished because of this conversation with this lady. I've been nourished. Verse 36, let's keep on going. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. You see, he was involving them in the harvest. And it's always that part. You know, just like on Sunday mornings here, this is always, you know, the product of a team effort and all laboring together, all contributing together, practicing, learning how to play these instruments and hook up the AV stuff, all working together for that common good. And Jesus is about to involve these guys in the harvest. Verse 37, that's the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you, you remember he sent them into town for food, but then he's diverting their attention to something that's much greater. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. 
Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. I remember it was uh, August 1979. It was my first year to be entrusted with my own campus to be the Baptist Student Ministry Director. And the one who'd gone before me is my boss today, Bruce McGowan. He had been at that college, Eastfield College. It's in Mesquite, East Dallas. And I was reading this passage on our way back from, we'd been to Glorieta, New Mexico for a student conference. About five or 6,000 college students from all over the country had been together. And I was with my group uh, on that bus, and we were coming back home. And I remember this phrase, somebody else has done the hard work before you. And I knew that I was given the privilege of being able to play the role as the director of the Baptist Student Ministry at Eastville College because Bruce had done the hard work before me. And he handed me that privilege on a silver platter. And then the one who'd gone before him had done the same. And the one before him. You know, I I think every Sunday when I drive up, and uh, you know what? Uh... We are all benefiting the labor of those who've gone before us. It was called out, Jimbo mentioned this morning, the heritage that we all benefit. We reap the harvest of the labor of others who've gone before us. We're in a building that other men built. Other men paid for. Other ladies. Every Sunday morning, we get to walk into a privilege that was set by those who've gone before us. And I think Jesus was just calling that to to their attention. Another great Thanksgiving theme, isn't it? You know, that we are benefiting from what others have done. Okay, verse 39. And this is where the story really gets good. Many of the Samaritans from that town, look at the verb. They believed. That word we talked about two weeks ago. Believe. Metaphor or synonym for that word. You remember what we said? Trust. They trusted. Many of the Samaritans of that town believed in him. And look why. Because of that woman's testimony. Wow. And here was her testimony. He told me everything I ever did. This was a lady who was fully known. Fully loved. And she just couldn't keep it back. She went into town to all the people she had been avoiding and said, Hey, you've got to come get close to this guy. He knows me through and through. All my stuff. All the people knew her stuff. No secrets. Small community. But he treated me with dignity and loved me anyway. And so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay. And he stayed for two more days, staying close to Jesus. Again, remember... This was a community, this was a town that any self-respecting Jew would have totally avoided. They invited Jesus to stay, and what did he do? He stayed. Stayed in the place that others would have avoided. And look what happened. Because of his words, many more became believers. And then look, they expressed appreciation, thanksgiving to her. Verse 42, they said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. And now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the Savior of the world, the Messiah. Look who got it first. A lady who was looked down upon by her whole community and a community that was looked down by all of the Jews. She was the first one who Jesus told, you know that Messiah that you mentioned? That'd be me. And now Samaria gets it before the Jews did that Jesus was the Messiah. What an incredible story, right? And I just went through, there's a couple of things more that just really impressed me this week. Verse 28, let's go back to that one phrase. And that's why I've kept this picture up here the whole time. She left her jar behind. Just think of it. That which had been so important to her for so long, all of a sudden, wasn't even important anymore. Isn't that something? She even changed her agenda. You know, her routine was well established. 
She prob this was probably her daily routine. Come to the well when nobody will be there. Come get in that routine and have me. I, oh, I love routine. I, I think God made us like routine on purpose, and I, I love my routine. But look what this lady allowed to happen. She let her routine be interrupted. You know, just because that was what she'd been accustomed to, this encounter with Jesus, this close encounter with Jesus, even her routine. You know, she threw it out the window, and she allowed her routine. How often, you know, we, we have, you know, we're, we think we have so many important things to do, and, and uh, we see a need along the way. Well, but I've got my routine. I've got my schedule. I've got to keep people waiting on me. And, you know, she had someone waiting on her at home. But she interrupted her routine because of this encounter, encounter with Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this about that. We must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. We must not assume that our schedule is our own to manage, but allow it to be rearranged by God. She left her jug. Great example for me. Not only did she allow her schedule to be changed, she even allowed her priorities to be changed. You know, water is pretty important, isn't it? What, our bodies are made up like 98% water? It's the most important element on earth because we all know that without water you cannot make coffee. And so this was a pretty good errand that she was on here. But even her priorities changed. And that which was, you know, the big important task of the day. She left that empty jug behind and left it there. But I think the empty jug, I just kind of like rattled around in that empty jug a little while this week, and I thought of it. Was it not also maybe symbolic of all of the mistakes that she had made? You know, it wasn't a full jug. It was an empty jug. And I think that she probably looked at life and thinking, man, I'm empty. I've tried so hard to be known and loved. And at least five times it didn't work out. I made some assumptions last week. I, I, I implied that she had been divorced five times. But if you look at the text, it doesn't say that. It only says that she had had five husbands. And there's more ways to lose a husband than divorce, right? But she still... She still had tried so long to be filled, known and loved, and it still hadn't worked out. And apparently she had some reservations about the current relationship because she wasn't married to the man yet. I think the empty jug probably also was you know, a metaphor for her life than she felt, that she just empty and it was dry. But she left the empty jug jug behind. So maybe it was a metaphor too of all the mistakes. Not only the pursuit that she had been on to be known and loved, but maybe even the mistakes. All those mistakes that she had made. Um, I have a friend who uh, her name is Daphne. And I asked her if I could share her story with you. And she said, this is what we do. This is my f former student, Daphne. She was involved in the uh, Baptist student ministry at San Antonio College back in the early 80s when I was the director there. And uh, uh, I actually, in, upon asking Daphne if I could share her story, her reply was immediate and sure. Absolutely, this is what we do. I said, well, you can go. We will, this message will be posted so you can even go see it and see if I represent you fairly. And so, hey, this one's for you, Daphne, and uh, recognizing the good work that God has done in your life. But Daphne and this lady had some similarities. Different categories, but there were some similar things. See, Daphne for many years had some demons that haunted her. Really gave a lot, a lot of problems. Demons of addiction. She was married, had two dear children, but these demons kept, kept Daphne in this dark corner. And this went on for years and years and years. Until finally, Daphne had an experience 
in a residential rehab program for women addicts. And it was in this program that God began a new work in Daphne's life. And you know what? Daphne left at that rehab program. She left her empty jug. She left it there. And she has experienced, you know, that close encounter with Jesus that changes your priorities. I think she would be the first to say for years and years, life revolved about tending to her addiction. And so many other things went undone. But you know what? Uh, as bad as the regrets are, she left her empty jug that, in this metaphor, represents all the mistakes of the past. She's on a whole new path now. And guess what Daphne does every week now? She goes back to the rehab program. And she shares with the ladies there, Hey, I know you. I know your stuff. I've been you. You can be rescued from this. And so she is the biggest cheerleader of these ladies who had the same problem, have the same problem that Daphne had. Isn't that a redeeming story? And here's the woman at the well, same thing that she did. She went back to those who had taunted her, and then she was an agent by God, and revival broke out in the whole place. Whole place. Isn't that something? Reminds me of... A Second Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.4 says this, God helps us in all our troubles so that we can help others who have all kinds of troubles using the same help that we ourselves receive from God. That's what Daphne does every week. Isn't that good? Another passage is reminds me, 2 Corinthians 5.17, you may have heard this verse before. Um, uh, if any man be in Christ... It's a new creation, kind of like born again, right? Old things have passed away. The jugs, they're left behind. Behold, all things become new. Not only are we redeemed, you know, when we let God do it, do His redeeming work, but then the next verse, Second Corinthians 5, 18. Um, all this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies and friends. And then the last phrase, and gave us the task of making others his friends also. That's what the woman at the well was. She was an agent for making friendship with God. She went and told the whole community, guess what? Revival broke out because they got close to the Messiah, Jesus. Oh, what great stories. You know, I'm thinking if we, we think, you know what? Robert, you don't know my stuff. I've made these mistakes, and those people know about it, and so I don't have a testimony anymore. That's been squandered. No, beg to differ. <laughs> it was because of this woman's problems that she was in a position to be an agent of redemption for the whole community. Not beside the problems, but because of the problems. That's why this is such an incredible story. God meets us right in the middle of our stuff. She was in her routine, doing her thing, her empty jug life. Got close with Jesus, changed everything, changed the community around her. My goodness. And I got to think about it yesterday. I was driving back to San Antonio from one of my trips, and I was thinking, redeemed? repurposed she had a brand new purpose for her life she serves as a great example for us I don't know if, how many of you I didn't get it to Alfonso till last night you know this little clip that I made you know my I come from a long line of very frugal people and we still have the place where they exercise their frugality and there is so much stuff at our farm that was repurposed Things that served one purpose and now another. I could show you. It's a museum of repurposed stuff. <laughs> but I got to thinking because I'd been there some this week. I'll just tell you one of the things. The old fireplace and the old farmhouse was built in 1889. 
It was built by frugal people, poor people. They made do with what they had. And so the fireplace was built out of those native iron ore rocks. They're not the pretty ones like the Austin Stone. They're just chunky, old, rusty-looking rocks. And that's what they built the fireplace out of. But then in order to be fancy, on the inside, I wish I knew the story in detail about how this came about, but there's a bunch of old ceramic tile pieces, just chunks, just little broken ceramic tile things that somebody, I guess probably my great-grandfather, careful and painstakingly put on the front of that old stone fireplace. I wish I had a picture. I thought of it too late. I was already back home where I would show you a picture of it. And it is just a picture of broken pieces cemented to the front of that old fireplace. And there's one whole piece of ceramic tile, the whole square, it's right in the middle, right above the fireplace. All the rest of it, broken pieces. And so that says a lot to me about a lot of things. One of the things is somebody took a bunch of broken pieces and made something pretty out of it. And it's a testimony to me that in our brokenness, pretty things can still be made of our lives. Daphne illustrates for that, that for me, and that old fireplace illustrates that for me. Well, okay, let's bring it close to us, and we'll finish up with this, okay? What made the difference in the lady's life? Something that all of us have the same access to. She just got close to Jesus. And this was even probably a brief conversation. My guess, you know, we just have a few lines of it. Probably a conversation that would have taken less than 30 minutes. But think of how much God did in her life in 30 minutes. Changed her whole life. And so each of us can go to that well. And each of us has this incredible resource, the very words of Jesus, that we can take some time out of our busy, busy routines, can we not? And just stop and spend some time with Him. The very words of Jesus reserved for us in this book. And you know what? When we do that, He does the same thing in our lives that He did in this lady's life. Change our priorities, change our schedule, change our agenda, takes our broken pieces, and even because of the broken pieces, makes us an agent of God's own love and care in the lives of the people around us. Couldn't make this up, could I? Too good a story. All we did is read it, and that's what it is. Well, that we would spend some time with Him this week and be open to Him changing our agenda and be an agent of His love the people around us. What a great way to spend Thanksgiving week. And how many of us will be with family members that we don't see routinely, but we'll get some time with them. And that we can have the same kind of impact on them that this lady had on her community. That's what I'm praying for us. That's what I'm praying for me this Thanksgiving season. I'll be praying for you as I'm away. And let's finish praying that today. Lord, thank you for this story. Just one of so many just a little brief story can be read in seven minutes and show so much about your nature and how much you know us and know all of our stuff and love us anyway. Help us, Lord, get so close to you that we can't but be changed. And then look at the people around us differently. Even people we avoid, go to them on purpose and be able to share the good stuff you're doing in our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.